Hello friends, what's up? It's Jamie here. Welcome back to another episode of the Mission of Marcia's vlogs. Sorry the lighting's kind of weird, the sun is doing some some weird things right now. Um, but yes, this is this is the, <laughs> this is what we're working with for this video. Anyway, Mission of Martius, in case you don't know, is a fantasy adventure audio drama that I am currently in the process of developing, and these vlogs are meant to serve as a bit of a behind-the-scenes look into that development. For today's episode, I wanted to properly introduce the six main characters of Mission of Martius. If I'm being completely honest, Mission of Martius has quite a large cast, and I'll definitely be talking about the supporting characters in a later video, but for right now, we are just going to focus on the six main characters since they are the six main characters. They are who drive the story forward. But first, I felt that I should talk a little bit about the world that Mission of Martius is set in since I felt that that would help set the stage for the characters. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So Mission of Martius is set in the fictional world of Renea, not at all related to the Albanian counter-terrorist and critical response unit. I literally didn't even know that that's what that was called until I just happened to look up the word Renea for this video. I just chose it, honestly, at random. Um, so no association, no relation. It is just Apparently it also means like reborn or like rebirth. So, you know, let's go let's go with that <laughs> meaning and not any association again with the Albanian counter-terrorist and critical response unit. Anyway, what you're seeing now is a bit of an old and semi-outdated picture of Renea. This was done by my friend Amelia, also known as Lenmana underscore on Instagram. Um, but this is still what Renea looks like generally, so I will be referencing this picture for the purpose of this video. So Renea has a barrier that separates the western and eastern hemispheres of the planet. This white ring that you're seeing is what the barrier looks like from space, but up close, like on Renea, the barrier actually resembles more of an impassable mountain range. I'm not gonna talk too much more about the specifics of the barrier because that very much heads into like very heavy spoiler territory. Um, so for now, this is all you need to know about the barrier. Renea is a world home to two main races, humans and fairies. And historically, humans and fairies have been at odds with each other for hundreds of years. The story of Mission of Martius takes place in Renea's Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere of Renea has six human kingdoms. We have Harmonia, Sapente, Fortis, Presidium, Potestatum, and of course, Martius. There are also two large fairy societies in the Western Hemisphere of Renea. These societies aren't necessarily kingdoms. They are ruled by councils, not monarchies. Um, but so we have the Enchanted Cove, which is also known as the birthplace of fairies, and we have Fey Portum. The main two kingdoms that you need to know about right now are Harmonia and Martius, and the main fairy society that you need to know about is the Enchanted Cove. Each kingdom has their own attitudes and laws regarding human-fairy relations. For example, Harmonia has been historically pro-fairy, whereas Martius has been historically anti-fairy. Our six main characters of Mission of Martius are all from Harmonia. Well, technically, one of them is originally from the Enchanted Cove, but now lives in Harmonia, but we'll get to that when we get to that character. Okay, now that I have laid the groundwork for the world that we are in, Let's get into our six main characters. As you can probably tell, I'm like really trying to lean back so that like the sun isn't like completely like beaming down on my face. So <laughs> I feel like I'm I'm also kind of trying to keep like my hands down too because I feel like if I wave them around too much, it's going to catch the, the light and it's going to reflect all weird. So if you're wondering why I've been kind of like leaning back and like if you've watched my videos, you know I tend to use my arms and my hands a lot and why I seem to kind of be a little bit more chill. That's literally the only reason why. Like I promise I'm still using them. They're just kind of being like, hey, <laughs> they're down here. <laughs> Alright, the main characters. We are starting with Delilah de Claire. Delilah, or Del for short, is 15 years old. She is a soldier in training. She is also Ella's older sister. Also, here are some reference pictures in case anyone wants to do some fan art. I'm going to do this for each of the characters. And also, I'm not saying that you have, no one has to draw me anything. I'm just saying in the event that you were like, oh, I want to draw one of these characters. Here are like the reference pictures for what they look like. Um, and I'll also like give like character descriptions too of what like their physical appearance is like. Um, just in case. Again, no pressure. You don't have to do anything. I just 
felt like it might be nice to include. So Delilah, as you can see here, has wavy black hair. It's a bit unruly. Um, she has dark brown eyes and she's white, um, but not super pale, more like a peach um, like skin tone. Uh, she also wears a solid red bandana like tied around her neck. Um, I know that that's not super clear from the reference pictures. Um, she's also 5'3", if you're wondering her height. Hi, this is Editing Jamie here. I forgot to mention this in the video. I can't believe I forgot this. Um, but for, like, Delilah's, like, physical, like, character description, she also has a, um, ruby ring, a ring that has a little ruby gemstone on it that she wears on her index finger. It's very important. I can't believe I forgot about it um, because it also has like some very like important lore implications. Um, obviously that I can't talk about right now, but yeah, just know that. But yeah, so she wears a, uh, a ruby ring on her left index finger. All right, so <laughs> Delilah getting into her character, she is an interesting person. She's very passionate about becoming a soldier because her father um, was the former commander of the Harmonian military, so that is a big dream, a big goal of hers. Um, she is fiercely loyal. She will literally do anything for the people she loves. Though there aren't that many people that Delilah is particularly close to because Delilah is a difficult person to get along with. She's impulsive and reckless. Um, she also has a bit of a loud mouth. Like she kind of will just kind of fly off the handle sometimes um, and just like say whatever. Um, and you know, she has a tendency to resort to aggression, sometimes even violence when things don't go her way. She's not, she's definitely not the easiest person to be around all the time. Delilah is also a bit arrogant because her dad was the commander of the Harmonian military. Delilah kind of has this attitude where she thinks that she's better than other people, or at the very least, she feels as if she always knows best and that other people, particularly Ella, her sister, should always listen to her. As you can probably infer, Delilah's character journey is largely about her learning restraint and discipline and also recognizing and realizing that there are consequences for her actions, for how she treats people, even if she has the best intentions, and she usually does have good intentions, but those intentions very rarely outweigh the impact of her actions and how she behaves around other people. Also again, I've changed my, um, my angle because the sun is really bothering me today. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on. It's like so bright, like blindingly so. Um, but anyway, <laughs> moving on, next we have Mira Griffin. Mira is 18 years old. She is the younger sister of Lily and Mason Griffin. Um, she's super sweet, very sociable. Um, she's also a very curious person. Also, here are Mira's reference pictures. She's black, she wears her hair in a braided bun. Um, she has brown eyes and she is 5'6". Unlike Delilah, Mira is actually pretty well liked amongst her peers. She's very friendly, very nice girl, um, but Mira is, even in spite of that, a bit of a lonely person. Um, she doesn't have that many close friends and that's really because she feels a bit lost and directionless in her life. Mira feels like everyone else she knows has their thing, their career path, what they know what they want to do with their life and Mira's still figuring that out and she feels a bit insecure about the fact that she hasn't had it all figured out yet, which definitely isn't helped by the fact that Mira is very much the kind of person who feels like her worth is determined by what she can offer to other people, which is a bit too real for me. <laughs> it's like, sorry about that Mira, like you definitely got that one from your creator. Apologies. <laughs> Mira really is such a sweetheart. She really loves to help other people. She also has a bit of a tendency to stick her nose where it doesn't belong. Like I said before, she's a pretty curious person, but she really does have the best intentions. Like she's not trying to just be like nosy just to like get the gossip or like anything. Like if she finds out that something is like going wrong for someone, like she's really gonna go and like try to help them. Mira is also very clever and she has a lot of good investigative skills which is definitely very helpful because there are a lot of people as we, as you guys, <laughs> and Mira will come to find out in the story. There are a lot of people in Harmonia who are keeping secrets even 
people in Mira's own family. Um, so she's going to be doing a little bit of uh, detective work in the story. Mira's character journey is really about her finding her own self-worth, determining what it is that she wants to do with her life, and also uncovering, discovering, um, that she has some special gifts that really set her apart from everyone else. I can't really get into what those gifts are, um, cause that is very much spoiler territory. Um, but, you know, um, just keep in mind that there may be more to Mira than anyone knows about her, that even she knows about herself, so just, just keep that in mind. <laughs> Alright, next we have Lily Griffin. Her full name, like her legal name, is actually Aurora Lilith Griffin, um, but literally no one calls her Aurora, she's Lily. Um, she's 19 years old. Born in the Enchanted Cove and now living in Harmonia, Lily is a nurse. She's also the apprentice of Rosemary Hyacinth, who is the director of the Harmonian Hospital. This is actually really important because Rose is a former member of the Fairy Council of the Enchanted Cove. Like I mentioned before, the fairy societies in Renea aren't ruled by monarchies, they're overseen by councils, and so Rose is a former member of the Enchanted Cove Council. So Lily's apprenticeship is actually quite special, but that's for a later video. I'm not going to talk about it too much today. Anyway, here are Lily's reference pictures. She is Latina, not by Renee and Mectrix, because our real world races and ethnicities don't translate the same way in the world of Mission of Martius, but if Mission of Martius took place in the real world, Lily would be Latina. She has olive skin, her hair is like a chocolate brown color which she wears in a braid. The braid falls over her left shoulder, her eyes are a deep green. I've kind of always described them as like an emerald green. Uh, Lily also has this little red begonia pinned to her blouse just below the neckline. It's on the opposite side of where her braid is, so on her right side. Um, and she also has pale green wings, and they're, they're quite big. Lily is also disabled. Her right leg is amputated below the knee. She has a wooden leg. It's not like a peg leg, like it looks like a leg. Um, it's just made of wood. Oh, also she's the same height as Mira. She's 5'6". I think that covers everything about her physical description. So Lily is Delilah's best friend and she is Mira and Mason's adoptive sister. She was adopted into the Griffin family after her parents died when she was younger. Um, and she is a very resourceful and dependable person. She's also quite wise for her age. Lily's known for being very kind and compassionate. She's also very much known for being very patient, particularly in her friendship with Delilah. She really sees Delilah as like this younger sister figure because they grew up together. You know, there are a lot of people who don't like Delilah for obvious reasons, but there are some people who like really don't like Delilah. Like they're afraid of her. They think that she's like a monster. Um, and Lily is like really one of the few people who really sees Delilah for who she is as just like this troubled kid who's overcompensating. Like I said before, Lily is someone that a lot of people depend on. She has a lot of good leadership qualities and like Mira, she very much like wants to help people. She very much cares about helping as many people as she can. She will never turn her back on people who need her. Lily is also a flora fairy. We'll get into the different types of fairies that exist in Renea and all the different types of magic, but as a flora fairy, Lily has an affinity for healing. It's why she's a nurse and Rose's apprentice, who is also a flora fairy. Rose is also the one who gave Lily her first wooden leg when she was a child. Um, and because of the wooden leg, Lily's walking is a bit stiff. Um, she uses a wooden mobility aid. It's like, I don't know what it's, I'll like insert a picture. Um, I don't know what it's called. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily like a cane, but it's a mobility aid that she uses at times um, to assist herself. Lily's leg also affects her ability to fly. Like she can fly, um, but she can't really go for prolonged periods flying without experiencing pain. I promise I'll get into like the technicalities of how that works and how the magic works with fairies and all that jazz um, in a later video, but for right now I really just kind of want to stick to character stuff. A lot of Lily's character journey is really about her kind of like 
stepping up and becoming the leader that she was always meant to be. Like I said before, it's been pretty evident that Lily has always had the potential, even from a young age, to become a great leader. A lot of people in her life have always seen that. Um, but because she's pretty young and inexperienced, she still, like, is very much navigating, like, how she wants, like, what kind of leader she wants to be. And so her arc is really about figuring all that out and, again, becoming the leader that she was always meant to be. All right, next we have Ella de Claire. Ella is 14 years old. She is Delilah's younger sister. Ella is incredibly intelligent. She has an eidetic memory, also known as a photographic memory, and she has a vast and extensive knowledge of the world and fairies with a particular interest in cartography. Just got back from the dentist. The lighting has clearly changed. My brother's girlfriend brought over her cat. Don't ask too many questions, we're moving along. <laughs> we're getting back to talking. Well, I mean, for you it's gonna be a couple seconds. For me, it's been about an hour since I, <laughs> I sat down and was recording. Anyway, here are Ella's reference pictures. She's white, just like Delilah, though she's a bit paler than her sister. Um, she has straight black hair that she wears in a loose ponytail. She also has deep purple eyes and she's five foot my height. <laughs> As you might be able to tell, Ella is very different from her sister where Delilah is loudmouth and impulsive and reckless. Ella is quiet and reserved and thoughtful. Ella's very cautious. She's not the kind of person to take unnecessary risks. She usually has a plan for everything, or at least she tries to. And when she isn't trying to reel Delilah in from her antics and her general chaos, um, Ella can usually be found at the Harmonian Library, curled up with a mountain of books. Even though out of the two Declare sisters, Ella is definitely the one who has more of her shit together. Something she struggles with a lot is constantly feeling like she's in Delilah's shadow because she kind of is because it's like because Delilah is so abrasive and just like hostile towards other people by association people kind of look at Ella differently too and so people kind of tend to like keep their distance from her so it's very difficult for Ella to make friends and it definitely doesn't help that Delilah is just extremely overprotective of her sister so in addition to like Delilah's bad reputation. Delilah also has this like attitude of like, oh, these people aren't good enough to be friends with my sister, which really tends to scare a lot of people away. And again, it makes it very difficult for Ella to kind of like branch out and meet new people. So Ella's arc is really about her stepping out of Delilah's shadow and becoming more confident in her own skills and abilities because Ella is really quite capable. She's very intelligent, very strategic. She brings a lot to the table, even though she's not as physically strong as her sister because, you know, Delilah, Delilah talks a lot of shit, um, but she is able to back a lot of that up because she's a very strong fighter. But, you know, Ella has her strengths too. And another really big part of Ella's arc is, you know, confronting Delilah and like kind of calling her out on her behavior and how it impacts Ella because most often than not, like Ella is the one who is like very directly affected by Delilah acting out. Next, we have Mason Griffin. He is 26 years old. He's Mira and Lily's older brother and he's a blacksmith. Here are Mason's reference pictures. He's black, he wears his coily hair in a low and also short ponytail. His eyes are a deep brown, not quite black, like they're still definitely brown, but they're like a deep brown. Um, and he is 5'10". So Mason is a family man. Ever since his and Mira's parents died when they were younger, um, he has kind of assumed the role of man of the household. And it's a role that he takes very, very seriously. He essentially runs the Griffin household with his Aunt Tabitha, who's one of their only living relatives. For Mason, his family, especially his little sisters, are his everything. They are his world. He would do anything for them. He absolutely loves them to death. Mason isn't the sole provider for the family because obviously Lily has a job and so does, again, Aunt Tabitha. Um, but Mason, despite having people around him to help him, has a bit of a tendency to take on the brunt of providing for and protecting his family just all on his own. Mason also has a little bit of a tendency to be a little too overprotective of his family. 
like especially with Mira because she's the baby, he's prone to underestimating just how capable the people in his family are because you know Mason again he like I said, he pretty much sees himself as like the protector, like he has to take care of everyone. And so that kind of leads him to underestimate just how capable the people he cares about are. Even though he has the best intentions, sometimes it doesn't, it kind of gets lost in translation from time to time. At the end of the day, Mason's a practical guy. He's very passionate about his work as a blacksmith because his father was a blacksmith. And so this is kind of his way to continue his legacy. He also just really enjoys being a blacksmith. He's kind of a nerd about it and it's very cute. And so Mason's arc is really about him finding the best way to support his family as the dangers of the world get more intense but also recognizing that you know Mira and Lily are growing up and they are really coming into their own as young women and so they they don't always need to rely on him for everything like they definitely still need Mason but they don't need him to do everything for him and so that that's a big part of his arc is like coming to terms with that and last but certainly not least we have commander Cassandra Landerson also known as General Landerson, also known as the baddest bitch in Harmonia. <laughs> I'm only half kidding with that last one. She is a badass. I love her. Cassandra is 27 years old and the current commander of the Harmonian military. She assumed this position eight years after James declared the former commander, Delilah and Ella's father, was killed in the line of duty. James was also actually Cassandra's teacher and kind of acted as a bit of a father figure to her because Cassandra's relationship with her actual father is pretty strained to say the least. Here are Cassandra's reference pictures. She's white, she has red hair that has been cut short to a bob. She has light green eyes. She's the same height as Mason, she's 5'10". She's also pretty buff, like she's pretty muscular. Cassandra is well respected amongst the majority of the Harmonian military. The same can't necessarily be said for some of the older political figures in Harmonia, but generally speaking, more people like Cassandra than there are who don't. Cassandra is pretty much known for being very stoic. She's not particularly expressive with her emotions, at least not with people that she isn't close to. Um, she's definitely a little bit more expressive with people that she feels like she can trust. Um, she's also very strong-willed. Like, when Cassandra sets out to do something, like, you, you know that she's going to do. Like, she's absolutely going to accomplish that. Like, no questions asked. Cassandra and Delilah also have a bit of an interesting relationship because on the one hand, Cassandra cannot stand Delilah. She thinks that she is a brat and a nuisance and that Delilah's skills are wasted on her. But at the same time, Cassandra also feels this like sense of like protectiveness over Delilah because she's James's daughter. And so they have a bit of a connection due to that. Um, but at the same time, she can't stand Delilah. Like, they go back and forth a lot. And it's the same thing for Delilah. Like, Delilah thinks that, like, Cassandra is, like, overbearing and annoying, but she also has a soft spot for Cassandra. Neither of them will ever, like, admit it. They go back and forth a lot, but yeah, their their relationship is, <laughs> is quite interesting. Cassandra is very committed to serving and protecting the people of Harmonia, but she also feels a lot of pressure to kind of, like, live up to James's legacy because that's really what a lot of people expect of her like people kind of think like oh she's supposed to be like the next James and it's kind of it's difficult for Cassandra because like on the one hand she wants to kind of like figure things out and kind of like lead in her own way but on the other hand sometimes she's like what would James do in this situation so a lot of like her journey is kind of like finding that middle ground of like you know respecting the teachings that she's learned from James and who kind of like James was as a leader and a person, but also kind of like, you know, forging her own path and being her own person as a leader. Cassandra's also incredibly strong as a fighter. She's very skilled with the sword. She's good at hand-to-hand -hand combat, particularly with her sword skills. She really learned that from James, especially because James was kind of like really no, like James was an all around like good fighter, but he was really known for his abilities with the sword. Um, so that's where she gets a lot of that from. Um, Cassandra's also like very mentally tough and she's like, she's, she's very strong in multiple ways, but this kind of like 
causes her to have difficulty with relying on other people from time to time. Yeah, it really does not come easy for Cassandra to rely on other people because she has a lot of trust issues that has to do with some stuff in her childhood um, and like her early adult life. Um, but yeah, so Cassandra has a lot of trust issues and so she only, like I can count on one hand the number of people that Cassandra like genuinely and like absolutely trusts, like no questions asked. And so Cassandra's character journey is really about, like part of it's about her becoming like physically stronger and becoming a better leader and finding her way as a leader. But another really big part of it is kind of her learning to trust the people around her and to rely on them as well. All right, that's all I have for today's video. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of the Mission of Marcia's vlogs. The next vlog will be coming out mid-December and that vlog will be about the Mission of Marcia's soundtrack, so stay tuned for that. As always, let me know if you guys have any specific questions about Mission of Marcia's. They can be about anything and I will do my best to incorporate them into future vlogs. Once again, that's all I have for today's video. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I upload Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, except when I don't and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys!